Welcome back to Wall Street Prep's DCF modeling lesson. This is part two of a two-part series. In this video, we're going to cover how to calculate WAC, how to go from enterprise to equity value, and as well as answer this last question here. Uh, just to recap what we did in video one, we forecasted free cash flows five years into the future, and we will discount those cash flows back to the present to arrive at the present value of what we call stage one. We then estimated what the value beyond the explicit period will be uh, using growth and, perpety, per, growth and perpetuity method. The value beyond the explicit period is what we call terminal value. Now again, these values look a little bit funny because we haven't yet calculated discount rate or WAC. That's something that we're going to actually calculate in this video coming up. So now that we uh, have a recap of, of the first video, let's now tackle what we want to tackle in this video, which is WAC, as well as going from enterprise value to equity value. So before we even begin, what I want to do is just discuss what WAC is and why we use it. So WAC is the weighted average cost of capital. It is a blended rate of return for all the capital providers of a company. Technically, there, if a company had preferred stock, you could include that in the WAC calculation. Now, many practitioners don't do this because preferred is not a very common part of capital structure, and if it is, it's, it's, it's usually pretty small. But nonetheless, from an academic standpoint, yes, you would want to include it. Now, you're probably saying, well, why are we using WAC as the discount rate for our cash flows? Well, just to recall, this is an unlevered free cash flow analysis. To recall what an unlevered free cash flow analysis is, it is before the payments of interest. EBI is before interest expense. In other words, these are cash flows that are available to all providers of capital, not just the equity investors. Had we used a levered free cash flow approach, the appropriate discount rate would have been cost of equity. Now, WAC, as you can see, accounts for everyone. That, and so to make this an apples to apples analysis, we should use WAC to discount these cash flows back to the present. Now that we understand uh, why we use WAC, let's now start tackling this section. So the first thing we're going to have to do is reference share price. So given that our valuation date is January 1st, 2013, let's reference the $25 share price on that date. Regarding the diluted share count, we're going to use the 500 that you see. Now, what do we mean by diluted shares outstanding? Well, company has basic share count, which you typically get from the front page of the filing, but that's not really all the claims of ownership on a company. Dilution accounts for all the different ownership claims. So those claims arising from options, warrants, convertible debt, or convertible preferred that are in the money. So we want to account for all the different ownership claims. That's why we're using diluted share count. Next on our list, you see cost of debt. And we've got tax rate and then after-tax cost of debt. Well, you're probably wondering, well, why are we using after-tax cost of debt? Well, to answer that question, let's take a look at our free cash flow buildup. As we mentioned before, this is an unlevered free cash flow approach, which is before the payments of interest. But we know something very special about debt, and that is interest expense provides a real tax shield to companies who pay taxes, of course. So that interest expense reduces taxable income, in some, can some cases, a substantial amount. So because we're doing an unlevered free cash flow analysis, some might think we're ignoring the effect of interest tax yields. The fact is we are accounting for it. We're accounting for it in our WAC calculation, and that's why we take the after-tax cost of debt. This after-tax cost of debt represents the interest tax shield that the company experiences by using debt in their capital structure. So to calculate after-tax cost of debt, we take cost of debt times 1 minus the tax rate, and we get 3.1%. So you can see that that is significantly lower, lower than the 5.2%, and again, it's because of the interest tax yield. Now, cost of debt is not a very highly debatable topic. If you're dealing with a company, usually use yield to worst, uh, and if you're using comparable company debt, you usually use yield to maturity. Practitioners as well as academics don't really butt heads on this. Cost of equity, on the other hand, is a highly debatable topic. And, you know, business school professors versus uh, practitioners tend to disagree on what, should, uh, what cost of equity should be. 
and it's highly debatable compared to cost of debt because with cost of debt, you know what you're getting, principal plus interest expense. Uh, with cost of equity, you don't really know what you're getting because it's a combination of potential dividend payments and price appreciation. So some of the competing models that exist are Fama French, uh, dividend discount model, as well as capital asset pricing model. Now, we're going to focus on what pr practitioners use, which is capital asset pricing model. And that is equal to the risk-free rate plus beta times the market risk premium. Now, uh, this is essentially the formula for the security market line of a given market. So assume that we did that analysis and we came up with 15%. So debt holders uh, request, well, 3.1% after tax, while cost of equity or equity holders demand a 15% required rate of return. So now that we know uh, what our costs are for debt and equity, let's now figure out what our capital structure is. Uh, what our target capital structure will be. Now, that's sort of an important point. You want to, uh, in your WAC calculation, use what's the target capital structure. For most mature companies, which we will assume for our model here, the existing capital structure is the target capital structure. And the other thing to note is that you typically want to use market values for both debt and equity, but many times you don't have market values for debt. So what you want to do is if you know your... Uh, valuation date is, let's say in this case, January 1st, 2013, the 2012 balance sheet numbers will be the latest numbers available before that valuation date. So we could go ahead and use our uh, debt as well, our, our debt figure from 2012, uh, given that that uh, book value is a good proxy for market value. So to summarize, if you don't have market value figures for debt, book value is an acceptable proxy. So let's go ahead and reference the book value, which is 4250 4, while our equity is going to be share price times the diluted share count. If we go ahead and add those together, we get our total capital of 16750 So my debt weighting is going to be the debt divided by total capital, while the equity weighting is equity divided by total capital. You can see that this adds up to 100%, and it should. And again, if there were preferred stock, you would do the same thing, figure out the amount of preferred that's in the capital structure, and apply, uh, apply a weighting there as well. So now that we have our after-tax cost of debt, our cost of equity, our, our, I'm sorry, our debt weighting as well as our equity weighting, we can calculate WAC. So WAC, again, is going to be a blended rate of return. So if we have our equity weighting, we can multiply that by cost of equity plus our debt weighting times after-tax cost of debt. And this should give us 12%. So that's going to be our, our cost of capital. Now, if we go ahead and link that into our model, you'll see that our cash flows will start to update with the appropriate present values because we've now inserted the discount rate. And now we're going to assume that WAC doesn't change in the terminal value period, I mean, for the terminal value. So we're going to use 12% again. And again, our stage two has now been updated with the correct present value. So now that we've actually calculated WAC and brought that into the model, we could go ahead and calculate enterprise value, which is the sum of our stage one plus stage two. But again, we're concerned with equity value. So we need to go from enterprise value to equity value. How do we do that? We need to subtract out net debt. In other words, equity value equals enterprise value less net debt. Okay? So keeping this formula in mind, we'll go ahead and uh, calculate this. So Regarding net debt, I know most of you are thinking, well, we'll just use plain vanilla debt. The truth is you want to use all gross debt or all non-equity claims. So such items could include gross debt, I mean debt as well as preferred stock, minority interest, really anything that's considered a non-equity claim, we want to subtract out from enterprise value to arrive at equity value. In our case, we're using a simple example. All we have is debt and we're going to subtract out cash because we're dealing with net debt. 
In other words, net debt is equal to debt less cash and cash equivalents. And the whole idea with net debt on Wall Street is that practitioners believe that if you have excess liquidity, you can go ahead and pay off some of that debt. So we're going to assume that. So enterprise value less net debt provides our equity value. Now, if we bring in our diluted share count, 500, we can figure out on a per share basis what the equity value per share is. And that becomes, that is $35.15. So if we take a look at this question, if the stock is trading at 25 bucks a share and we believe that the DCF analysis is accurate, would we buy or sell the stock? I believe that if, if our DCF analysis is indeed correct, what we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna want to buy this stock. Well, the reason is because if we believe that the stock should be valued at $35.18 and it's valued at $25 a share, then the stock is considered cheap. So we would want to go ahead and buy it. Okay. So now you can see how you can use this, this really powerful analysis to make decisions for investments or trading or whatever it is you might be doing with the DCF. So just to quickly recap what we did again, we forecasted free cash flows into the future. We discounted them back to the present using a discount rate that reflects the riskiness of the capital. That gave us stage one. We then went ahead and calculated stage two, which is value beyond the explicit forecasted period. And that gave us a stage two value of 14,595.8. Uh, after calculating uh, stage one and stage two, we calculated WAC. We're using WAC because we want to use uh, a discount rate that's available to all providers of capital. So then we were able to discount stage one and stage two back to the present. Adding both together gives us enterprise value. Subtracting out all non-equity claims gives us equity value. And dividing by the sh diluted share count gives us an equity value per share to which we can compare market value to make a decision. This concludes the second video to the DCF modeling lesson. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Thank you very much.